Hi and welcome to Law Advisor, India's first video-only knowledge sharing platform on law and policy. Today we have a very interesting discussion on the corporate landscape, the Indian context. We have been seeing there is a lot of change that's happening when it comes to corporate regulatory landscape in India. Uh, you know there are a lot of promoter-driven companies. At the same time, we are seeing inflow of many foreign companies coming into India. Our government is focusing a lot on ease of doing business, and the regulations are getting amended accordingly. So today we would be discussing some of these aspects, and to discuss this, we have an esteemed panel with us. We have uh, Ms. Tipika Chaudhary. She's Executive Director, Legal, APAC at Xerox. And we have uh, Mr. Gaurav Banerjee, Senior Advocate at Supreme Court of India. He's also Overseas Associate at Essex Court Chambers, London. Welcome, Deepika. Welcome, Mr. Banerjee. Thank you for taking time out for us today. Thank you for having us here today. Thank you, so Sanya. So to begin our conversation, uh, you know, uh, firstly, considering, you know, uh, Mr. Audrey, you have a background of the corporate uh, side of it. So how do you see that international foreign companies navigate uh, through this corporate regulatory landscape in India? And how do they cope with the challenges um, that our regulatory landscape offers to them? So I think uh, when we talk about navigation, I think it's not any different for us as it is for Indian companies. We all, you know, operate in the same world. Rules, same rules apply to all of us, and the environment is the same for all of us. Uh, so, for example, if we have anything which is uh, which is which is which is a concern for us, or we have an issue, we try to work with industry bodies. For example, CII, and you know, for example, we have another association of uh, industry which is. Uh, ITI, we work with them to sort of, uh, you know, put forward our questions or our concerns and, uh, and we find regulators to be more receptive and there is a two-way communication now and they are more receptive and also, you know, somebody is hearing you now. So I think that's uh, one way to do it. And the other, I would say that, you know, uh, over the period of time, we've seen that, you know, the world has changed. I think uh, COVID has, uh, you know, left us uh, with a totally different world. Everything is getting digitized. So in that context, I would say that, you know, the law has to some extent, you know, kept pace with the changing world around us. Uh, company law went through, you know, complete overall in the recent times uh, and the decriminalization of a lot of procedural aspects of it uh, has helped uh, with the you know with the robust compliances etc similarly if you see lmpc is also you know is another uh, act where uh, decriminalization of procedural aspects uh, is sort of on the agenda now uh, and um, you know and uh, Gaurav can talk about you know all the uh, changes in the Arbitration Act and, you know, the competition law uh, went through a lot of changes. So, and now we also have, you know, employment code or the labor code that has uh, gone through a lot of changes. So, uh, considering all the changes, I think uh, a lot of these are, of course, very welcome changes. And, uh, and I think, for example, uh, during COVID also, there were a lot of uh, relaxations given to to you know companies or to industry um, you know for example you know we we did all our board meetings during covid time online or virtual board meetings uh, law was already there but i think covid expedited everything the implementation of all of that uh, in addition to that you know the the relaxation around uh, uh, one physical presence of the board member in a year uh, was done away with and you know we were able to get all our foreign directors uh, attend all the board meetings through the year virtually so some of these changes or some of these relaxations have uh, definitely helped uh, so i think in that context i would say that uh, you know we have been able to strike a very good balance mr banerjee to add on yeah so um, you know as a litigation lawyer, the only time I encounter such problems is when obviously things go wrong. So I won't be able to give such a holistic view. But having had an experience of uh, many uh, regulators, the point that I want to highlight is that each one has their own quirks. Whether you go to SEBI or RBI or subject matter regulators like PNGRB, 
So every regulator has its own quirk. And I think so far as foreign companies are concerned, there is a vast difference between theory and practice. You have to acquire some degree of domain knowledge to deal with, you know, regulators. And I found that Deepika mentioned, uh, you know, decriminalization. But it's, it's amazing. There are some statutes uh, like, say, SEBI. There aren't that many uh, um, offenses. But you look at something like the FSSAI, Food uh, Standards uh, Authority. There are 608 provisions which are, um, you know, which have criminal import. So I think, you know, there has to be some sort of uh, domain knowledge. And, you know, people like Deepika uh, are critical to uh, being the interface to which international or foreign companies can tackle this issue. So, I mean, it's a challenge. It's not, I mean, Deepika makes it sound easy because she's obviously on top of her game. But it's a challenge. And when things go wrong, as they often do, then uh, one sees that side of it. True, mm true. -hmm. That's that. So that takes us to another part of it. Like we discussed about foreign companies. Uh, you know, Mr. Banerjee, we're also seeing that India does have a lot of family health companies, you know. And um, at times, once they start growing um, into, you know, much larger um, they, there are, uh, you know, various issues that they face. And at times, they, their listed public companies get dragged into it. So if you can highlight, you know, how these kind of companies are tackling with this issue, or if you can highlight the current scenario, you know, how is it viewed by the foreign companies as well in India when they see these kind of issues being dragged, uh, you know, into media? So, Sanya, there are always two sides to, to this and, uh, you know, there have been a lot of very high profile disputes in the public domain. Uh, but uh, what is interesting is it's not merely uh, family health companies facing off against foreign companies. This problem of public listed companies sometimes arises even between, you know, family groups who are fighting. And uh, the, so it's a, it's a very interesting legal question. The question is, these are public listed companies. Surely they have a separate personality. They are run by a board. But we know that the reality is the board is the board, but the promoters run the show. The family is behind the, the uh, public listed company. So there is a tension there. And when foreign companies come in, then you have lawyers like us or not like us, going in for elaborate arrangements, which often tend to unravel. Um, so the question, the, so the legal question is this, and it's now being debated now, and there's a very, very recent judgment of the Supreme Court on the 6th of May. And there's this uh, doctrine called the group of companies doctrine that you sometimes use to rope in even public uh, listed companies, you know, public listed entities, into a dispute. So sometimes you use it as a weapon to bring in, uh, you know, some, some third party company, which really may not be party to the dispute. So now the Supreme Court in a very recent judgment seems to be having some doubts about this as to whether there should be separate corporate personality, whether there should be party autonomy, or to what extent you can involve public uh, companies in, in interstate disputes. So the question is, you have to watch this page because now this is going to a constitutional bench. But the reality is, I mean, the, the reality is family run businesses have their own dynamics and uh, we've all seen what they are in the past. Uh, but it's, it's, it's an interesting state in 2022. We don't know which way it's going to go. True, that's that. So uh, that just takes us to the last leg of our conversation as well. Uh, you know, while we discuss the aspects of foreign companies and uh, our Indian companies as well, we just wanted to understand, you know, um, how India is working a lot towards our ease of doing business, which actually matters a lot, whether it's just for our Indian companies or to get better foreign investment as well. So uh, I just wanted to understand from both of you, how do you view these changes? Uh, 
Yeah, so I mean, I can talk about, let's say, uh, you know, all these reforms that you're seeing in the labor uh, law. And uh, I think this was long overdue. Uh, we have some of the laws or statutes which are as old as almost 100 years old. If you look at Wages Act, which was, I think, uh, originally it was 19 in the year 1936. Similarly, Trade Unions Act was uh, in 1926. So, uh, you know, obviously there was a need for the change. And however, having done that now, and although it's not still not uh, come for implementation, but having done that, there are, of course, some things like when, when a new law comes, there are good things. And there are also some things which pose some challenges for the, for, the, for the industry. So on the good side, I would say that, for example, this whole concept of uh, trying to support the gig workers uh, by, you know, introducing this fixed term contracts, uh, which I think will help the uh, uh, companies as well as uh, the you know unorganized uh, labor uh, and we have 90% labor in this country is unorganized or and with, with the uh, gig uh, economy now booming uh, you know you are looking at people who are looking to have some sort of a social security and that's something at least uh, you know statute does provide for it for the gig workers as, as well. So I think that is a welcome change and it will not only help the, the workers or the labor, it will also help the companies to quick, quickly ramp up if there is a project-based uh, you know, uh, business or if it is something like a, you know, you're know you running a marketplace, you want to quickly ramp up and ramp down. And if your business is some sort of a seasonal business, then obviously that is something which is a big positive, I would say. Uh, but when I talk about challenges, there are also many challenges. One is, of course, you know, when you will start to implement it, you will start realizing that it's not as easy as it looks, because obviously you already have certain policies and processes and governance routines. Uh, implementing a, no a new law is always, uh, you know, it always poses its own set of challenges. Uh, to name a few, for example, the, the whole definition of wages is is pretty uh, confusing or it it can sort of uh, go into some sort of interpretational issues uh, later because you know if you what is included and what is not included for example and if your bonus stat bonus is included what about the performance bonus will that be included or will that not be included in your definition uh, similarly you know uh, the, this definition of this concept of workmen as well as employee and these both these concepts already exist in the law however now uh, they have uh, you know sort of uh, made it uh, mandatory for the employer to sort of classify you know who's your workman and who's your uh, employee and uh, india is you know a lot of companies are service uh, companies and it is they don't make that distinction to first for first of all to do that to make that distinction and uh, to classify and people are working on the same floor how do you classify that and how do you have different policies for uh, for your employees i mean you will have to have two different sets of policies of course and how will you communicate that to to the employees to say that okay you are a workman but you are not right and some of the employees who are like we have we already have a concept of blue collared and white collared some of the white collared employees who are not uh, managers they may also want to be classified classified as workmen because uh, obviously they will get uh, you know better benefits etc so from that point of view i think there are of course challenges uh, while while earlier i talked about the fact that you know we welcome all these challenges uh, all these changes that have uh, you know come in the form of reformatory laws but at the same time when you are to implement these uh, you know these laws uh, they pose their own set of uh, uh, challenges for for the for the for the organizations so just to uh, take up from where deepika left off uh, how do i view this the i view this uh, through the prism of obviously the people who meet me who essentially say that the changes are very positive but there are many miles left to go and if you look at it holistically um, deepika focused mainly on labor codes and such. But if you look at it holistically, there is still a major tangle of regulations at every stage, from the stage when you invest, you have FEMA, LDI, you have regulations in environment, employment, of course, is mentioned. None of those codes have been properly notified. You know, you have uh, aspects of tax, you have aspects of competition. You have, you have, you know, I mean, the list goes on and on. You have um, data protection, 
you have any number of uh, uh, regulators you have product liability so the i mean the the net situation is that yes is a business there is some progress in reforming the law but there are still so many hurdles that you may trip on one without even knowing it so i think the answer really is uh, we are on that uh, race of 100 meters we are halfway there and there is still some distance yet to go seems to be the reaction it's a qualified yes thank you so much thank you uh, mr banerjee and mr adri for actually sharing your views on this so just as part of uh, closing remark what would you have something you know um, just as a closing remark on the corporate landscape in india just some two lines on that sure so i think uh, from my perspective i would say that you know there should be more uh, it should be en- engaging process you know it should be all the stakeholders should be on the table uh, when these reforms are being discussed or implemented and the other one i would say that you know sufficient time should be given to the industry to implement anything new that uh, that is expected to be implemented for example all these restrictions with certain countries trade restrictions uh, if industry is not given time that poses uh, a big big problem for the industry so if i could sum up uh, what uh, deepika said in another way um, so far as reforms are concerned it's a it's a great idea but you should hasten slowly you should give time but you should progress also and you must consult with stakeholders and that is a bit of a weakness i think the consultation pro- process and the should be a little wider thank you thank you both of you actually very well said because uh, one thing that's always considered is while there's consultation there is lack of representation at times of the stakeholders like corporate councils like mr adri and even at times having uh, you know representation of uh, policy expert or advocates like you mr banerji because ultimately it has to be implemented by the companies so one has to see if their you know views are put forth or not to just to understand what challenges they go through so thank you again for this conversation thanks a lot thank you thank you